55-year-old attorney sent for mitral valve repair with known heart murmur for the last 20 years. He's active uh, without limitations. Recent physical examination, they heard a louder murmur, went to a cardiologist, the diagnosis was severe mitral regurgitation. So he's coming to you with severe mitral regurgitation. And you've been through all of this discussion on early operation versus watchful waiting, and that's why we have Dr. Schaff up here to kind of give us a surgical um, input. But just for the sonographers in the audience, it used to be that we would always wait for symptoms to operate on a patient with severe valve disease. But because Dr. Schaff can now do an operation with a less than 1% risk and actually repair instead of replace the valve, we're going earlier and earlier before the left ventricle starts to deteriorate. So that's kind of this whole concept of watchful waiting versus early operation. Now, once he was told that the diagnosis of mitral regurgitation was made, he might need something, he started getting short of breath, which, which always, we, we've always seen this, that always happens. But um, he's now referred to see you for consideration of robotic repair, because he's otherwise healthy, and Hartzell, what's the operative risk of a 55-year-old, otherwise healthy person who needs a mitral valve repair in your hands? Well, I, I think we would tell the patient the risk is less than 1%. Uh, no matter how much less than 1% it is, it's never zero. <laughs> okay. Um, blood pressure, 130. Venous pressure normal. Carotid's full. Lungs are clear. LV slightly displaced. He's got this pretty prominent two over six late systolic murmur with multiple systolic clicks. So that's what you hear on examination. Here's the echocardiogram. Now we won't have, um, we want you to interpret the echo because you, you came here to, to, to kind of talk about echo. And we'll just show you some segments of each one. Okay. We can always go back. And I picked just a few segments. Um, Lauren, what about two jets? Wait, any? Well, it's always harder to quantitate when, when you have two jets, because mainly because the PISA equation has uh, been more robustly validated for a single jet. But you can do that. You can add the... the uh, so are two jets pretty common to see? Yeah, I think, I think it's quite common. In the commercial view there, it's always on each side of the A2P2 coaptation. So that's a common place. The striking feature on the, both the color and the Doppler is the fact that JET is not holosystolic, yeah. which, which matches your, uh, your description from yeah. the physical exam. And Hartzell, from the surgical standpoint, um, if they describe multiple JETs versus a single eccentric JET, does that change your approach or management? Well, it, it, uh, to me, it's an indication that there's maybe myxomatous mitral valve disease with often with bileaflet prolapse, so you don't, you would not have a ruptured cord. Um, and these valves can often be repaired just with annuloplasty alone if it's, if there's not a single segment that's prolapsing. Maybe we'll look some more. Okay, we'll keep on going. Here's how um, our echo lab kind of zooms in and changes the Nyquist limit to be able to get your PISA. And Agris will have a session to do that, right? Yeah, we'll have the, the breakout session. We can talk about uh, technique. Okay, because I think in 2021, anybody who has an echo for severe mitri, for question mitral regurgitation should have quantitation of that severity of mitral regurgitation. Okay, please respond. Okay, see it. So some would exercise test, some would send for mitral valve repair. A couple of the interventionists would probably put in a clip. A few would do nothing. Buzz? Well, um, one thing, if we went back to the hemodynamics, something that uh, Soren brought up really important, that it's a mid to late systolic jet. I've had patients that have had severe MR with, with non holosystolic mitral regurgitation, but they have typically had very large regurgitant orifices because it, if you think about the equation, you're going to multiply your ERO by your TVI of MR, and if you only have half of an MR signal, you have to have a big ERO to get that kind of 
regurgitant volume, so I'm wondering how the TVI was traced. Yeah. Here's the newest guidelines that were released last year. I think they're pretty well written. <laughs> um, but if you have, so, so we're going to, in, in this course, go over primary versus secondary mitral regurgitation because you have to differentiate between them. the treatment and the thought process is completely different. But if you have severe primary mitral regurgitation, you have to see if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. So I, I think the treadmill would be a, a good idea and stuff. And a lot of patients, you know, get this diagnosis, they start developing symptoms, you don't know if the symptoms are due to the heart. So I, I, I think that would be good. But even if they're asymptomatic, go over to the asymptomatic that we have stage C1, and their ventricle hasn't deteriorated yet, if they have a high likelihood of mitral valve repair, then it's reasonable to proceed with an operation to prevent the long-term consequences of long-standing volume overload. And um, that's been pushed earlier and earlier and earlier. So severe primary mitral regurgitation, irrespective of whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, if you have somebody like Dr. Schaff, it's a no-brainer for me. You, you go ahead and send them to operation. Um, the caveat here is what Soren and Buzz pointed out, is that on auscultation, Am I standing in? On auscultation, um, you hear a late systolic murmur. Now, most of the severe mitral regurgitations, especially in the older men, are due to chordal rupture, and they'll have a whole systolic murmur. Now, and for the sonographers, bear with me, because this late systolic versus whole systolic, you'll be able to identify yourself on the continuous wave Doppler. And that late systolic murmur usually means it's not all that severe. The outcome of these patients is actually quite good because they probably don't have severe mitral regurgitation. Um, because he was sent for the uh, procedure, um, and Dr. Schaff always likes more information, and he and I are old enough that we actually like to go back to the cardiac catheterization laboratory, but it is another way to be able to kind of break this tie on how much regurgitation there is. First of all, we exercised him just to see what his symptoms were, and with exercise, he went a good workload and his wedge pressure was completely normal, which means he's not getting a volume back into the left atrium and pulmonary veins, which is causing symptoms. That's number one. So we know, actually, he's asymptomatic. And then we did this old-fashioned left ventriculogram, and just for the sonographers, we've got a catheter in the left ventricle. You see the catheter is injecting contrast, and then over to the left-hand side, you see the squeak of contrast going back in the left atrium. Now, Hartzell, you always ask us to um, do a left ventriculogram. What's your thought on this? It looks mild. Okay, and, and because? Well, there's, there's leaflet prolapse, probably bileaflet prolapse, but only mild leakage. Yeah. So the, the nice thing about um, contrast left ventriculography is, you, you know, in Doppler, we're looking at velocities, and we're making all the assumptions on velocities. But on contrast left ventriculography, you're actually looking at the volume of, of contrast going back from the left ventricle and the left atrium. And here you just see a little whiff. So this is mild mitral regurgitation. Well, and we even exercise them because there's some data coming out now saying, well, maybe with exercise, you might have more mitral regurgitation than there was. Um, Martin wants you to comment on the size of the LV, and I think that goes into this. So his LV size was, was normal. So he, not only does he not have severe mitral regurgitation because there's late systolic murmur and a late systolic jet, but his LV size was normal. <laughs> So, so I, I'll take this one, Nish, because yeah. I, I, think, I think it's important to, to remember that things have to make sense all together. You know, if you report a regurgitant volume of 60 cc's and you have an end diastolic volume of 150 and ejection fraction of 60 percent, that doesn't make sense, you know. You're not going to have enough forward stroke volume to account for all that. So that's important. The other thing I was going to say, beware of the linear measurement of the left ventricle. We've seen numerous times that the ventricle can be big on biplane, volumetric, rather than with a, mono, with a single linear measurement. So, so 
reconcile all those, but I, I, the, the way it looked like, the ventricle didn't look big, so it looked normal. So, you're, you're, so the, point, the, the question was, why don't we do a cardiac MR? And I didn't believe it, okay? But, but we've got uh, three cardiac MR guys now um, and one MR woman who have done a number of them and we're correlating them all with everything we're doing. I believe the MRs. So in the, in, my, in the future for me, MR looking at volumes and regurgitant fraction is gonna be the way to go. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Perfect. Dan, then you wanna say a couple words about MR? Yeah, no, I, uh, I totally agree with you. I think that's sort of now becoming the gold standard for all our volumetric sort of measurements. And I think what Dr. is actually crucial, it's sort of correlating our data to make sure that it makes sense with what we're seeing clinically. I think as we're getting better with quantitation of MR, and we do it in two ways, both volumetric and then using velocity encoded sort of sequences um, and making sure that they corroborate, um, that gives us that internal consistency that validates hopefully the clinical impression. Yeah, so before a year ago, I'd order an MR, they wouldn't tell me anything about the mitral regurgitant. They'd just say, well, it looks mild or moderate. But now they're actually giving me regurgitant fractions, regurgitant volumes. They're telling me that the, the, the um, uh, technique by which it's done. And um, I, I think your group has done a beautiful job. And in the future, my ARs and my MRs are going to all be sent to an MRI scan. And I, I'll just emphasize one of the points there, ERO overestimates the severity for, for non-holosystolic is clear, clearly true. But the way you overcome that is accurately calculating the regurgitant volume. And I suspect that that whole CW I think a holosystolic tracing was made to get the TVI because I don't think there's any way with an ERO of 0 0.42 you'd get a 60 cc's if you trace just the half of the CW signal that yeah. was there. Yeah, so there was an error in interpretation of the signals that yeah. you'll be able to go over with the sonographers. But I think from the clinical standpoint, you know, we get the, the sometimes we just get the echo reports back. And if we don't have the ability to kind of interpret things ourselves, there's some clinical clues like the late systolic murmur and the fact that the LV is not normal size that says, hey, wait, we better think about how severe this mitral regurgitation truly is. Question there and then Soren. Was there, was there one jet or two? The analysis was done on one jet, it looked to me, but in the commissural view, it looked like there were two. Yeah. Hard to tell, so, so if I were in the lab reading that, I would do both of them. So you do R square, R square, square root, and then, then you compensate for the two. So you try to quantitate the two of them because they are separate enough to be quantitated separately. Um, so I don't know how, how it was done. Um, what I was going to say, Nesh, is if you decided to go for a stress, uh, go, go for broke, go for stress hemodynamic study. You don't suspect ischemia necessarily in this patient. The question is, is the MR bad? And if you do that, you'll be surprised because most of the times, in my experience at least, I don't know if Jeremy can, can say something or buzz, uh, the regurgitation actually decreases because your left ventricle decreases with exercise and systole, and then, then usually, usually there's a little less MR. Yeah, no, I agree. And that, that was actually one of the questions. Is, yeah. So in this case, what, um, what type of exercise do you echo versus exercise treadmill? And I think it depends a little bit on the question. I think if the question is, is whether there's severe MR or not, then the echo obviously is gonna add something. And, and that's looking at the MR and how it changes with exercise, looking at the PA pressure, the RVSP. And we've recently added lung ultrasound too. And you see some of these patients where the MR gets worse, they actually develop B lines and pulmonary edema with exercise. So I think if, if, the, if the question is how much MR there is, uh, then, then the echo certainly adds something. And, and we do supine bike in a lot of these patients. Um, but if the question is, is symptom status, then probably some treadmill study, I think, is probably better. Uh, so whether that's a plain exercise treadmill or whether you add uh, cardiopulmonary testing to look at lung efficiency as well and, and cardiac output limitation. And you could potentially add echo to that too. But to me, it's, it's, it's a question of supine bike, which is probably a little bit better for hemodynamics because you can gather data at more versus treadmill exercise, that's probably a little bit better for determining exercise capacity. Um. Yeah, but from, the, from, from kind of an old clinician standpoint, a lot of it is done because they have vague symptoms. And if they can go 100% of their capacity without symptoms, they're asymptomatic. If they start 
bubbling out at 70% and say, Doc, I can't go anymore, then they're symptomatic. So Jeremy's right, we can get a whole lot of hemodynamic, but a lot of times the question, and that's why Jeremy said, what is the question? Whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, just put on a treadmill test or walk them up and down the hallway. One of the other questions that came in is, uh, how do you handle the, the two jets, the two jet peas idea? There's a, there's a formula you can use, but uh, basically what you do is you, you shift the baseline at a point and you focus on each jet separately, measure the radius of each jet, and just do the uh, PISA hemisphere uh, formula for both of them, add them together, and you only need to do the CW once because the gradient through both holes is the same and the duration of regurg is the same. So you, you do that part the same, but the, the key is you just have to measure each radius and then do the PISA calculation and add them together. And I think with your sonographer session on how to, we can go through that, but I, I really think you're gonna spend a long time looking at each little jet here and your MRI scan is gonna be able to give you a very accurate regurgitant volume and fraction in the future. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue to have more discussion on that, but things are changing all the time. But the teaching point here is that we are going earlier and earlier to mitral valve operation, but beware that the late systolic jet might not be severe and that you really can't have severe if your left ventricle's normal size and function. Absolutely, your load is so, your mitral regurgitation is so dependent on the load, and that's why even in the cath lab now, we're in more exercise in them, we're bringing in the echo machine, we're looking at the wedge pressure, we're repeating left ventriculography with exercise. Um, but you're right that MR is dynamic, and a lot of times we make decisions on a static thing that, that maybe we should be doing much more on, something for the future.